All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me all the way from Amsterdam here in Baltimore. I've been enjoying my time quite a bit. And I'm glad to be in front of this audience to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is cyber warfare. So this uh, talk is actually from the EU and NATO member cyber warfare exercises that I helped run in Brussels called the Vanguard uh, exercises. And to give you a bit of an idea about my background, I got into cyber warfare starting out at the U.S. Air Force's Space Command back in the day at a place called Buckley, if you know uh, anything about the early days before uh, U.S. Cyber Command. There were a lot of things going on there. I also came from Aramco, the Saudi Aramco family. After 2012, the Shamoon attacks, they gave me a call and an offer I couldn't refuse to work for them to help remediate and set up all of their security worldwide uh, amongst the entire family. And currently, I advise governments like the uh, individual governments and places like the EU Parliament on cyber warfare and artificial, artificial intelligence in cyber warfare. And I'm also on the all-party parliamentary group on artificial intelligence at the House of Lords as well. So I like to uh, have a lot of fun with technology. So when we start to talk about technology, I think all of us know that there are a lot of vulnerabilities, there are a lot of challenges, and what we're finding more and more is that a lot of these challenges that we think might be just a bit of a simple vulnerability, unfortunately, can be used uh, with devastating effect in large quantity against a particular government. So these are the types of trends we're seeing. Now, in the European Union and amongst NATO members, there has been some uh, very unusual and very challenging events that have occurred in the past few years. Uh, we have an issue with uh, the Crimea region, if you've ever heard of that, which borders on the European Union and is a European country. Uh, we've seen in Estonia earlier on, if you move a Soviet soldier hero statue, uh, suddenly you can get patriotic Russian hackers attacking your entire country's infrastructure. And nowadays, we're seeing a lot of push and pull from various governments. So we have influences in different countries amongst the European Union and NATO members with strong ties to the US, also strong ties to Russia. And China has lots and lots of money. They're going to be uh, investing in Italy, and uh, my government uh, in the Netherlands just announced yesterday that they're going to be using with KPN Huawei as part of their 5G backbone. So have the Germans, most likely the French, will follow suit. Uh, in the meantime, there has been a rise in uh, popularism in politics, which can be good can be bad, but it's not looking great. And we also have to deal with our own members trying to talk to each other because sometimes there are some old feelings between uh, the different countries. And they have their own alliances like the Visegard nations, which is some Central and Eastern European countries have much closer ties to each other than the European Union them, it themselves. So, to describe what these exercises were, the people who attended were ministries of foreign affairs, ministers of defense, ministers of war, or their second-hand person there. These were the actual decision makers or people who would advise the decision makers whether or not to declare an act of war, for example. So it was very important to get these topics to them in a way that they could understand. We had some ambassadors, we had some think tanks, and we had uh, a few non-NATO members uh, to join into the fun. And to warm them up, I went ahead and showed them uh, some very interesting but real things. Uh, one of the things that I was able to find was, for example, a power plant and an hydroelectric dam and a government bank and agriculture were actually controlled by a remote access Trojan, the same exact one, that was being controlled behind Vimple ISP in Russia. Now these things are actually part of critical infrastructure in the United States, right? We all like food, we like kind of like water and electricity, right? I do. 
And then I showed them a few other things that were a bit more realistic. This is the power plant. On the bottom, you can see that Modbus is in use. And towards the top, you can actually see uh, what Extreme Rat looks like in that particular version of Extreme Rat. And that was the one that was controlling all of these other locations as well. In addition, uh, this is a salmon farm, which uh, salmon for Norway, it's quite uh, crucial for part of their economy. And this was also being controlled by the same rat. Now, to make it not so serious, I do live in the Netherlands. And you might have heard that weed has been decriminalized for a while. And it is part of our tax base because it's heavily taxed. But places like Colorado, they're now basing part of that agriculture with their GDP. And if you can connect it to the internet, this is actually a grow operation uh, with um, no authentication. It's completely disabled and directly connected. And unfortunately, this was actually found in a country where it's not legal to grow. But just remember, if you're growing weed and it's IoT, secure it. <laughs> right? <laughs> so we don't have an official playbook for uh, how to operate in cases of cyber war because different countries have different definitions and there is no international consensus for what the definition is. We can't even decide what is critical infrastructure between country. So it's been very challenging. Now, uh, some of the NATO countries are nuclear powers. Some of the European Union countries are nuclear powers. One of the things that we wanted to do in conjunction with the European Council on Foreign Relations was to build a diplomatic toolkit for things that the people who are the actual decision makers could actually utilize during a large scale attack when it happens, and I do say when. And the, some of the different countries also have interesting laws, like the Netherlands, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they decided that it was legal for them to hack back anywhere on any device at any time if they believe that it can threaten their country or their economic base or their democracy. Uh, they're the only nation that legally can do that per their laws. And you do not have to be a Dutch citizen or resident. And it can be a smartphone, it can be a printer, it can be anything. Uh, so uh, things are a bit uh, interesting. And to describe some of the scenarios, it was a two-day event, and we were warming them up for the major one. And how many of us have, hmm, been so stressed out that uh, you, you get a little burnout? In IT, it's, a, it's kind, of a, kind of a thing because it can be a stressful position. Well, in the first scenario, what we did was we actually used an embassy employee who was suffering from some burnout, from some stress. And what he had started doing uh, was hoarding information and paperwork from the embassy and bringing it home. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, his adult daughter found the information and thought it must be declassified. So in this scenario, she wanted karma points on Reddit, and she also uh, posted information on 4chan before it was caught. Yes! So uh, also another reason why I'm glad I never had children. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, once, once it's up, it's, it's never going to come down. And also in the scenario, because she was using a regular laptop, uh, what had happened was it got infected by a virus by a cyber criminal organization that got all the rest of the information and started selling it on the dark web. So, uh, a fun scenario. Now, for number two, uh, it was a little bit more involved. And what we did was we gave them some, of de some very interesting decisions. Not all member nations have mature computer emergency response teams. For example, when I was last in Bulgaria not too long ago, their computer emergency response team doesn't even use encryption on their website. Yeah, it's OK. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, not really. So a security researcher, a hacker like us, uh, found a pretty nice zero day that could affect a lot of different equipment, including some critical infrastructure. And the rule is generally in Europe, you're supposed to go to your national level cert, because although there is an EU cert, they do not go into a country. They are an advisory group. 
So this particular cert was not set up with appropriate encryption. And when the researcher went to send the exploit, unfortunately, another government who was listening in, as you would, because wouldn't that be a great place to collect exploits, eh? Right? Uh, went ahead and grabbed that exploit and uh, also used it. On top of which, at the time, we gave them the scenario of the shadow brokers. Now let's say you are a country and you know that the shadow broker subscription exists. And you're pretty sure that your neighbor, might be a friend, might be a frenemy, also has a subscription. So we gave them the decision, what would you do? Would you purchase a subscription? Obviously not publicly, but privately. And for the final part of this scenario, we actually used uh, the Dutch uh, scenario and uh, the Dutch mistakenly hit a Chinese consulate and wiped some data. Ooh, it's not the best thing to do. How many of us have gotten an IP address wrong? Come on, there's more, right? So it, this is one of the dangers where you can make a mistake, human error, if you hack back and whoops, that might be a hospital as well, or might be something else. And so it, it, these types of methods, they, they really have to be thought through before they're utilized. Now, our final one, my favorite one, is called Dead Canary. And it starts out in the evening, one particular country, they basically get Estonian, so to speak, and their uh, national banks are taken out, their data centers are taken out, their telecommunications are taken out, and their government websites are DDoS massively. The very next day, we've got four events all at once, and these involve five separate countries. Now, think about diversion attacks and think about the ability for NATO to be able to do something in five different countries at once. This would be very, very challenging. So the next day, we used a uh, instance where attackers, a nation state, were able to get into the Rotterdam port and adjust the lock system, which tipped over a shipping container and killing sailors on board or missing. Then next, another country, they hit the electrical grid and caused an overvoltage to take out the transformers to cause massive fires and shut down the electricity. Right now, it takes up to 18 months for one transformer to be manufactured. And we're talking about a large country with at least 30 million people. In addition, we hit London. We decided to use this scenario because I also have advised for London Transport and I, I know their, their systems quite well. Uh, took out the signaling systems, manipulated things, and during rush hour in London made the trains go smashy smashy and causing mass casualties. And then shortly after, a particular large country's stock exchange is taken out by the uh, nation state adversary. Uh, we also had a, a twist in our exercise because we now realize that our relationship between the European Union, NATO, and the United States is quite strained at this time. So we wrote a letter which, uh, although we could not get someone quick enough to do the voice of Trump, I went ahead and, and we read the letter. And what the letter says basically for a paraphrase is, good morning, America. We have found out that five of our European Union and NATO allies have come under devastating cyber attack with mass casualties in the thousands. However, when I was last in Brussels at the brand new NATO headquarters, I warned them that all of the member nations needed to uh, invest in their defense with uh, the meeting the 2% GDP requirement for your defense spend as a NATO member. And they did not. Now is the time for Europe to stand on its own two feet. American blood will not be spilled. God bless and God bless America. Donald J. J. Trump. 
So what we did was we actually planned that the United States would not stand with us with Article 5 solidarity. And what would Europe do? And what types of diplomatic actions would they do? And would they take the lead and come to a consensus? Um, now, the scenario that we used was actually based predominantly on the Shamoon Aramco attacks. Uh, I, I believe I'm the only person who's ever publicly discussed it, and uh, trust me, I got a lot of pressure from uh, the government not to do so. But involved in the attack, there were a lot of telecommunications taken out. The Aramco network also uh, ran the network for the police stations and fire departments because they're a national oil company. So we based a lot of this on it and we believed it was extremely realistic. Now, one of the most important things that came out of this was the lessons learned. We could get small groups to come to a consensus, but as a whole, we could not get everyone to come to a consensus, which is quite scary. Um, in addition to that, the night before the final Dead Canary exercise, after drinking some wine with the staff, made a little bet to see if we could get any of our groups to agree to the nuclear option. So I won that bet because I used to work with a project called HEMP, Hardening Against Electromagnetic Pulse for US Air Force Space Command. And my group actually agreed to consider launching a nuclear weapon in the upper atmosphere of the attacking nation state to take it out in that manner. So what we tried to stress was they could not come to a full consensus, but preparation was absolutely key to begin to start talking to each other, taking these things seriously, and study that diplomatic toolkit because it will be needed in the background. Now, question is, how realistic is this? Uh, in the European Union, we've got a grid that is connecting every single member state, and electricity also feeds in from countries like Serbia. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, there was a deharmonization between Serbia and Kosovo, which did not deliver 113 gigawatts of electricity over a four-year period, causing system clocks on your microwave or so forth in the rest of the European Union to actually lose four to six minutes. And so we've already seen that's not a cyber warfare attack, but politics and geopolitics are already affecting these types of things. Now, there are some countries that rely a lot on solar and wind. And one of them, and I'll show you how easy it is to find some of these things. Uh, I used a simple dork in census.io. And I showed this at the European Union Commission, which is the same thing basically as the US Senate in October to show the fragility. So I was able to find uh, solar panels pretty easily because, you know, they're, they're IoT systems now. And I could quickly differentiate if there was anything more juicy because I like databases. What else can you get to? And then I was able to find basically all of Denmark's wind turbine farms. Uh, and Denmark is now working on this after the presentation, but Denmark relies heavily on wind. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have smart meters. Yeah. So there's a reason why uh, in the Netherlands, it's the only European Union country that we can refuse them. I do not have one. Uh, there is not a lot of security testing or requirements, and we worry about electricity. You can do a lot of very interesting things with electricity. If you send a very small overvoltage, you can actually set fire to uh, kitchen appliances because they're not made for that. So there's a lot of things. So I was able to find a lot of these devices, unfortunately, directly connected to the internet using various dorks in census, for example. And here is one where you may notice there's no HTTPS. And yeah, and there's the uh, login. And luckily, since they didn't do any real security testing, I was able to just bypass that with the file transversal and go ahead and get in, see the electricity, what the uses was, and also I could change uh, the pricing for the peak and off-peak, because it's fun. 
Now, in North America, you have a different system. And one of the things that they're doing between the United States and Canada is using something called the Open Automated Demands, Demand Response. And this is a management interface that ties in different protocols for controlling the electricity. So here again, pricing, demand, and you can connect to any of the smart appliances that it can actually see. So you're not supposed to connect it to the internet, but in uh, 138 milliseconds, I was able to find 75 directly connected to the internet. And here's one in Quebecois, Canada, which happens to be a hydroelectric dam, because I, you know, like water and electricity. And uh, they, um, they, they're not using a correct certificate either. So, you know, it's, it's nothing like a false, untrusted. Um, they're actually using a vendor demo certificate, which is not what you want to use at all. And I was able to find anything else that was juicy connected to any of the devices that were directly connected. Because, you know. So, <clears throat> when it comes to more and more smart stuff, because these things can also be used against us, um, how many of you have smart appliances, or a Nest, or an Alexa, or, yeah, yay, right? So um, this is a particular manufacturer out of Europe called Melly. I, I have desperately tried to get a hold of them. Uh, they don't do any security testing. And you can do lots of things with their appliances if you can find them, and they're not encrypted usually. This is a Melly hub, so if you've got about an extra $1,000, you can buy this smart appliance hub just for Melly devices, because you don't need that. But um, you can connect to everything that happens to be connected to it. And luckily for them, they actually hard-coded the username. So then, you know, all you got to do is, yeah, I see heads shaking like, yeah, no, no, yes, 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 bad. So if, if I wanted to uh, cause a diversion, there was a, a story I heard where when uh, Trump and uh, Clinton were uh, on the campaign trail, they were in the same kind of location, and what some bank robbers did was set off a bunch of alarms to divert things and also knew that the police were paying attention to the candidates, and then they went ahead and robbed a bunch of banks which was kind of cool, but these are home alarm systems that are directly connected to the internet. France has a problem. Yeah, I, I did this by, yeah, by, by uh, European countries, but yeah, they have a bit of a problem there. So, so France has been looking at that with their CERT, because they're now starting to do proactive scans like the Department of Homeland Security does. So that's kind of a good thing. And here's an actual house. Uh, yes, you can have a smart house, and you can do a lot of things with it, especially if it has cameras. And you can adjust the heat and shut it off during the winter time, because that's you know always kind of fun. And again, with no, no encryption, so we're, we're seeing uh, how some of these things can uh, affect us. And I should say there is one time I had to lead an incident. Uh, because a whole line of smart appliances, including smart fridges, were infected and were being used by a botnet network uh, for a spam campaign. So your house could be spamming you right now. Unfortunately, again, no encryption. I was able to bypass everything, see the cameras, see everything that I wanted, which is always fun. You don't want me to do that. So, <clears throat> to conclude, because I would like time for questions, is this is actually a picture 13 days after the initial Shamoon attack by the Iranians against Saudi Aramco. And what had happened was they took out about 85% of their Windows-based computer systems and things that connected uh, some of their industrial systems. So they could no longer auto-load any of these gasoline trucks, and there were miles and miles of them stuck there. They also had lost the ability to charge them money. Uh, luckily for Ramco, they're very wealthy, so they ended up giving away gasoline to make sure that the rest of the country ran. And after this was posted, unfortunately the Saudi journalist who posted this uh, has since disappeared, but I'm not saying it's a trend, but, and what had happened was, at this time, if you went to 
go ahead and try to get gasoline, how many days supply do you think that a country can use, or excuse me, store? They need it for their military, they need it for their police, their ambulances, and so forth. Saudi Arabia also provides a refined, pet, uh, refined gasoline, sorry, wrong country, uh, to Bahrain, and Bahrain was starting to get shut off. And one day after this, Qatar, Raz Gas, was hit with a variant of Shamoon. The big difference between the variants were ours in Saudi Arabia actually had a burning American flag. Uh, basically, it looked a bit like the flame attack that had hit Iran. I'm not saying anything, but I'm saying something. So. Um, one of the more difficult things with this particular attack was about 25% of the world's energy goes through Aramco every day. Uh, I think you might have heard on the news they are the most valuable company in the world. And we were facing a crisis where if, if we could not ensure the oil supply between 25% uh, of the world's energy from Aramco and 13% of the world's energy coming from Qatar, we were looking at the possibility of a barrel of oil being 400 to 450 dollars a barrel. Yes. Who likes expensive gas? No, right? So you can see if there is a country that is hit that is a primary supplier of something, it can actually have a domino effect around the world, which is one of the things that uh, we need to absolutely be prepared for. And many of these things can be solved on the back channels, diplomatic back channels, without pressing a button. Aren't you all glad of that, right? I am. And it really is because we've, we're seeing these more and more. Some of it's public, much of it is, some of it is not. Uh, we really do need to plan now. We really do need to get with our particular allies because one of the things that keeps me up at night is the fact that many European Union nations do not have cybersecurity as part of their national defense. I spoke about this in Berlin two weeks ago, basically hoping that uh, they would listen to me. So I'll go ahead and conclude and say thank you very much, and I would love to take questions. There's got to be some questions. Any question? Okay, almost any question. <laughs> ah, yes. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about the sham, a little bit more about the sham moon attack in terms of what the impact and some of the things we dealt with that impact? I know you talked about this in a previous talk, but uh, as far as applying that to future scenarios, what? What were the lessons learned? What were the main lessons learned out of Chad Moon that you can say apply to any scenario you talk about in your Okay, so what lessons learned were there from the Shamoon attacks? There were quite a few. Firstly, segment your network. They had a perfectly flat network at the time, and that's that's just crazy sauce now. Secondly, you need money. If you do not have the money to recover, you can definitely be put out of business. Uh, two, make sure you have printed copies. At the time, they had did a full digitization, and when they went to contact people, it was also during Ramadan, which is like our Christmas period, where most of the employees were allowed to take vacation. When else should the Iranians hit, right? And uh, they could not get contact information because everything was on SharePoint, and SharePoint was not functioning at all. Uh, another lesson learned was most of the employees at the time did not have cell phones. They had voice over IP phones for their desks, and there were no, no more voice over IP at all. So we had to buy a lot of cell phones as well. Another thing would be Make sure you have older equipment that you can jump to with a known good configuration. They had to dig out older equipment that uh, they knew that could work and even typewriters because they didn't have anything else to type. And they had to get fax machines out, which are not popular in use in Saudi Arabia or most of the rest of the world except if you're in Japan. They're, they're really popular there. So that, those were some very big lessons learned for us. 
Uh, not, oh, one big one, at the time when it happened, they didn't know really who to call because Saudi Arabia did not have a computer emergency response team, and they did not have these types of relationships with various companies and governments because they absolutely did not expect to be attacked. They thought, hey, we don't have any commercials, we've only got a, a few gasoline stations only inside Saudi Arabia. Who on earth would attack us? Well, there's, there's money and there's politics. So you're now a target. Yay! So uh, th those were the major lessons learned from the entire event. Yes. I see you. One, two, three. How about blue shirt first? Uh, On the uh, Yeah, you mentioned um, a lot of uh, European nations don't have uh, cybersecurity as a component of their national defense plan. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Um, I don't know if you want to uh, shame. Uh, talk about like, what kind of conversations you've had with them and what their reaction was. Like, how, how could that be the case in 2018? Well, like I said, uh, his question was uh, basically, kind of like which countries uh, don't particularly have this as part of their strategy and some of the discussions that I have and some of the things that I've been pushing basically, if I got that correct. Well, I've been pushing for a more proactive computer emergency response system uh, all across the European Union uh, for a few years now and also trying to push the seriousness of this matter. I'll actually be at a NATO event on the 9th of May discussing this more with them. And another uh, point that I've been trying to make for a few years now with uh, EU and NATO members is one of the ways that we can meet our defense spend requirements is through cybersecurity education. Tanks and guns are one thing, but we're moving now into a domain where that is just not applicable. But uh, we could not only meet our demands, but raise the uh, technological education of the country for the longer term by doing so. Those are the major things that I've been concentrating on. Is that, did I answer it enough? Okay, next question. So in events like the NATO games, do you see that people understand those lessons learned, or by and large are the policymakers still winging? Actually, they are learning and paying attention quite a bit, quite a bit. Uh, I think that that's due in part with uh, one of my partners in crime, uh, Stefan Soasanto, uh, who also is a digital fellow of uh, various things and is a nuclear weapons expert at the same time. So we like to be rather direct with ministers and luckily they actually listen to us and listen to me. I, I have no idea why, but they, 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 they do. So we're bringing them along, but then they have to get other people within their countries to actually listen. And that's the harder part. I'm not scalable. Did it, all right, next question. Um, what, uh Organization or governing body would be the correct one to define, in a legal sense, what constitutes a cyber attack. So the question was, which legal body uh, would I think that uh, should define what cyber warfare is, in and of itself? Well, I would say that. One of the uh, one good agency would most likely be the United Nations. It would at least start to set the tone. Now they did try to do negotiations with various countries about this, but we got some bad news in December of 2017 that one country, which shall remain nameless, at the last minute dropped out of the negotiations and ended it all, which was a shame because it had been worked on for almost two years at the UN. Questions? There's got to be more. I have a bit of time. I got one. Um, what can we do as like individuals to try and help the state of security in our nation without getting into politics or working with the military? Um, well, some of the things that you can do is if you see something, say something to the appropriate agency using encryption. <laughs> and because uh, they can't do everything. There's also some states that don't actually have a computer emergency response team. I got into a bit of a flame war with the now former Alaskan CISO because myself and another researcher 
try to uh, report a rather major vulnerability on some of their oil and gas infrastructure. And instead, the CISO then blocked uh, myself and the other security researcher on Twitter and LinkedIn, and also blocked our domains from sending email. So that, that's a bit of a problem. So we had to go to uh, another method. We even got one of the co-founders of U.S. Army Cyber Command involved to try to get uh, Alaska to actually listen. So if you see something like that and you are not very successful, try to then push it over to Department of Homeland Security and they'll, they'll help. So th there are certain things you can do. Always use encryption. Always encrypt. Good encryption and not a demo certificate. Please. Okay. <laughs> Don't do that. So. So in this scenario, you're starting the attack with the high destroyed communication, telecommunication system. Isn't that self defeating from the outside perspective that actually you destroy your avenue approach? Well, when we say telecommunications, there are various types of telecommunications. So in these scenarios, they were hitting some of the internet-based, VoIP-based, which is basically what most of our uh, telephone communications are nowadays. We don't have a lot of analog left, not really. It's uh, mostly digital. So they were trying to take out that particular infrastructure. And then at the same time, uh, they were hammering away at some of the mobile networks as well. But there's, there's always a way. There, there's other ways that you can keep different types of telecommunications up to keep launching your attacks as well from inside the country, even if it's closed off through the use of bots and, and other systems and perhaps nation state patriotic hackers that happen to be inside that country as well. Oh, uh, the question was, would it be, wouldn't it be self-defeating if you attack the telecommunications of a country, uh, basically ending the ability to perform additional attacks? Yes. Big question. A few years ago, I was speaking with an area command person for the Davis Mountain Air Force Base outside of Tucson, Arizona. When they go through um, joint operations with the city of Tucson, the state of Arizona, and the Air Force in order to prepare for emergency evacuation and all that, one of the main issues they were having with the key actors in the demos was they were getting away from having people in the field who had ever worked as like skilled labor. They had never done the hands-on things in the field. They had not grown up on farms or in construction or anything like that. And that was causing a problem even with the core of engineers or being able to put infrastructure in place. In any of these scenarios, when you're going through this with other countries, has something similar presented itself? So if I can summarize the question that uh, some of the people that are sent out for exercises and for these scenarios, they've run into difficulty because they don't have certain hands-on experience, not just with the technology, but we'll, we'll say non-tech tech technology. And yes, so the black energy attacks that hit uh, the Ukraine, the Ukraine has never been an extremely wealthy com country. However, they were able to go to manual operation within 13 hours, which was very good for them. Contrary to that, there was an event which didn't really hit the news, but uh, through a friend, uh, we, uh, in, in the particular country of Israel, uh, there was a variant that hit an Israeli power company. This particular power company was very, very modern, and they could not switch to manual operation until about 48 hours later. So in a way, it's kind of good to have old tech versus new tech. Sometimes it's not. And we've seen how do you go back to manual? How do you try to uh, keep your operations up and running while you're trying to fix everything else and get the digital sphere going? So yes, we did. We used that as well. So, another question? Yeah. What do you think it'll take for international cyber norms to be agreed upon? And what do you think they will be? Well. Uh, that, that's, now, the, 
international norms, use, and behavior. When do I think that uh, there'll be some sort of consensus? It's going to take a while uh, to have any sort of consensus unless there is a country like the United States which is the leaders in making that consensus. And it's one of the things that uh, was discussed in a workshop. I was just in Colorado Springs at the Joint Services Academy Cybersecurity Summit and we were discussing these particular man, uh, matters in a, uh, in a Chatham House Rules uh, workshop, so I can't tell you uh, who I, I was speaking with. But uh, I do want to stress that uh, the United States is the perfect nation to actually lead that effort, and many of the rest of the nations and our allies will most likely follow suit. I've seen from the Aramco attacks that uh, the Bronze Age civilization collapse. Uh, I know you probably don't remember it. It was a while back. But it was the first known major collapse of mass civilization, a domino effect. And we could see the same thing if a country like, or excuse me, a company like GE is actually attacked. So it could be very problematic. And that, that's why we need to come up with some consensus. And Europe is fantastic, but the leadership is fragmented. The United States leadership is not as fragmented. So I've got only a few more minutes left. Uh, do I have one more question there? So which country do I think is taking the best steps to educate its youth? Right now, I would say Estonia, because they have to. They are very digitized. They have digital IDs. They vote uh, with a digital ID. The residency is digital. Accessing their records, digital. They've got a very strong technology education system, because they have to. They've already seen what it's like to be under constant attack. One time for one more question. What's been your best tool or tactic to get buy-in from nations or organizations that you're working with in terms of cybersecurity? So what is my best tactic for getting big wigs to listen to me, right? Using direct examples. And I can pull up so many different direct examples that they cannot deny that it, it's just something that is an airplane or airport novel. It's actually reality. So by using actual examples and using their terminology, because they don't know what a packet capture is, so you have to explain it with uh, nice pictures that are not packet captures. So I uh, think I have time for one more. There you go. Yeah. How do I, all right, so the question was, I'm talking to uh, people who can direct change. How do I know who to talk to? Well, I, I've got friends and, and various think tanks and also governments that uh, make sure that I'm talking to the right people because otherwise it's just a waste of time. And that's how I do it. It, I, it works very well. It works very well. Uh, yes. All right, so I think we're actually out of time. Thank you very much, everybody, for having me all the way from Amsterdam.